Acts 15, verses 13 through 35. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agreed, just as, as it is written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the letters, and the brethren, greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying, You must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us, being assembled with, no, with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were set, sent off, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now Judas and Silas, themselves being prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. This morning we're continuing in the book of Acts in chapter 15, and as many of you know, I like to summarize the scripture, and there were a lot of scriptures there, so I really had to think about how do I pull all that into just one sentence, and if I can get this to cooperate with me, there we go. Um, it can be summarized pretty simply on this right here. There's nothing we can add to God's perfect work of salvation but we can adapt our behaviors to promote unity in the body of Christ. And we're going to see that as we're, uh, as we're working through these scriptures this morning, that first and foremost, the council at Jerusalem made that decision. Very, very clear. For all time, salvation came, comes only by faith in Jesus Christ, not by any work that we would do. And that would not be the work of circumcision. That would not be the work of following the laws that God gave through Moses. It is simply God's grace. But having said that, it doesn't stop there. That in order to promote unity within the body, in this case, Jews, very, very different in their cultural, uh, how they live and, and the laws that God had given them, very, very different than the Gentiles. But unity of the body of Christ is really, really important because if we don't work on the unity, you know what happens? We get conflict, and that's what we end up looking at today of how they handled a conflict and how they really managed to move forward with conflict resolution, to use a fancy uh, 21st century term. So in light of this, as I was thinking about 
you know, how to, how to create a, a thought almost to ponder with, uh, with what we're looking at this morning. Came to, with this. What matters most to us? Being right or apprehending the truth? Often that's the underlying issue when we're involved in conflict. In Acts 15, the early church was in sharp disagreement on a foundational issue, salvation. The conflict could have had devastating effects from hurt feelings and undermined faith to a church split between Jews and Gentiles. How the believers handled the conflict is admirable and instructive. Although folks on both sides of the issue had strong opinions, they were humble, respectful, attentive, and persistent to achieve a biblical understanding and consensus guided by the Holy Spirit. May we follow their example when conflicts arise. And for those of you who just heard the scripture that was read by Shonda, you may be looking at some of this going, well, I don't know how humble and respectful they really were. But when you look at the fact that they hung in in the process, that those that were wrong were willing to be shown that they were wrong, no matter how strong their opinions, no matter how biblical they thought their perspective was. There was an underlying humility, even if tempers flared, even if there was a strong clash that could not immediately be resolved. And so we want to look at that today because I think they're instructive lessons for us as the body of Christ. So as I was thinking about conflict and looking up illustrations about them, I came across this. Years ago, a large statue of Christ was erected in the Andes, the Andes Mountains, on the border between Argentina and Chile. Called Christ of the Andes, the statue symbolizes a pledge between the two countries that as long as the statue stands, there will be peace between Chile and Argentina. Now, shortly after the statue was erected, the Chileans began to protest that they had been slighted. The statue had its back turned to Chile. Well, just when tempers were at their highest in Chile, a newspaper man in Chile saved the day. In an editorial that not only satisfied the people, but made them laugh, he simply said, the people of Argentina need more watching over than the Chileans. Now, this next one, I don't know if this is a true story or not. I tried to dig into it. It's very, if it's not a true story, it rings true. And the story is told about a small town in Tennessee that had a place of worship with a sign in front. And the name of that church was Left Foot Baptist Church. A person who recently had moved to the town passed by that sign a number of times and always wondered, what is that left foot Baptist church? Well, one day while he was waiting in line at the grocery store, he turned to uh, someone who was now one of his new neighbors and he says, what is it with that church over there? What, what is this name, left foot Baptist church? And this was what he found out. He said, apparently years ago, there had been a split at the local congregation because they practiced foot washing. And an argument had broken over, out over which foot should be washed first. And the group insisted that the left foot take precedence. And they were not able to come to any kind of unity or conclusion of which foot should be washed first, of which foot mattered the most. And so essentially they took their ball and bat and they went home. They split and they moved down the street and they opened their own church and they called it Left Foot Baptist Church. And you know, unfortunately, that tells you all you need to know about the human heart. That's why I said, even if it's not true, somehow that rings true to the heart, doesn't it? That's the heart of humans without Jesus. And as I was preparing for this message, I was trying to do a little bit of research on, online. How many denominations, Christian denominations, are there in the U.S.? Because at some point, the more denominations you get, the more independent churches you get, all of this, at some point it's an indication 
people just couldn't get along. And they couldn't agree, sometimes on the smallest of things, and so they took their ball and they went home. And that grieves the heart of God. And when I found, looked up numbers, I mean, one suggested that there were well over a thousand different denominations. And that if you look, I mean, just actually probably, and this is not picking on the Baptist, but they're pretty good at this, there's, uh, there's well over a thousand different Baptist types of denominations, churches, whatever, that kind of thing. And it's on almost the corner of every uh, town, it seems you have an independent Baptist. And I say this because, you know, I was, I was initially a Baptist when I got saved, so I can say that. Uh, but it grieves the heart of God. So as we look at conflict this morning, let's remember we want to be a blessing to the heart of God, not a grief. So a little bit of history here for those who've been following along. At this point, the church is in full swing. The new church, it's been about 20 years since Jesus has died. And Paul and Barnabas have gone on their first missionary journey, preaching to both Jews and Gentiles. And a lot of Gentiles got saved according to their message. And so they come back. They're at Antioch now, which is about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. And... They've given the, this account of, of all the wonderful work that God did, including miracles. Um, and things are going well at Antioch. They've been there maybe close back almost a year. And then people come from Jerusalem, some Pharisees. And they have a somewhat different gospel message. And they start bringing issue that, you know, claiming that even for the Gentiles, that they cannot be saved unless they get circumcised and follow all the law of Moses. In other words, you have to become a Jew if you want to be a Christian and worship the Jewish Messiah. That unless you become a Jew, you, your salvation is in question and you essentially are not a Christian. So this great conflict arises in Antioch. There's lots of argument. There's lots of discussion. And they find they can't resolve it. So ultimately, they all agree, let's go back to Jerusalem, to the mother church, and to the leadership there. Let's present this to them. Let's argue the case from both sides, get their input, and let's make a decision. And so that's what they did. And remember, again, Jerusalem's 300 miles away. All they have is their feet to get them there. So for us to just say, oh, we're going to you know, go 300 miles away, we jump in our cars, we can do that in several hours. Not a big deal. Um, for them, it was an arduous journey, and it showed their commitment to resolving the problem. So at this point, the Jerusalem Council is meeting, and they've listened to Peter tell about how God had called him to a Gentile's home, to Cornelius, the uh, centurion, how God, how as he was telling them about the gospel, that God had literally poured his Holy Spirit on them, just like he had in Acts chapter 2 upon the Jewish people, that before Cornelius and his family made a profession of faith, before they could do anything else, God, you know, they, before they could get baptized or anything, God poured out his Holy Spirit. He showed his favor upon the very fact that they are responding with faith to the gospel message. So Peter has shared that story. And then Paul and Barnabas share their testimony of their missionary journey uh, to a, throughout Asia Minor, and all the, and, and what we find here is a little bit too is that they tell about all sorts of signs and wonders, and we don't even read about many of them. But it just notes that they noted that there were many of them. Again, God confirming their message, God pouring out His Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles, without them becoming Jews, without them being circumcised, any of these kinds of things. And so now we come to James who is really the pastor and leader of the church at Jerusalem. He's the one now who's going to give his perspective, cite some scripture, and bring it to a conclusion and build some consensus. And so that's why I call this scripture and wisdom, because those are the two things that James brings as we look at this next section. So first of all, okay, after they had become silent, in other words, after Peter had spoken, after Paul and Barnabas had shared everything, and there's just kind of a hush 
over all the people that are seated there to discuss this issue. So after they've all become silent, James answers and says, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon, that's Peter, <coughs> has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. So who is James here? Well, in this case, this is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Many of you remember the other James, the disciple, who was the brother of John. He's already been executed by King Herod Agrippa I. And a commentator, uh, Barclay, he mentions that James was the leader of the Jerusalem church. And his leadership really wasn't a formal office. It was moral leadership conceded to him because he was an outstanding man. He was the brother of Jesus, and he had had a special resurrection appearance by Jesus just to him as well. He was reputed by, uh, or, or regarded as, P as Paul had mentioned, Galatians, as one of the pillars of the church, one of the three pillars uh, that included John as well and Peter. Um, and his knees were said to be hard as a camel's because he knelt in prayer so often and so long. And he was such a good man that he was referred to as James the Just. And further, and this is the most important, he himself was a rigorous observer of the law. Even though he was a Jew, he continued, uh, even though he was a Christian and believed God and led the church, he never walked away from his Judaism or his practice of Judaism. And so if such a good man, if such a morally upright man, if who's such a, a legally observant man would come down on the side of the Gentiles, then all was well. And that's exactly what James did, declaring that the disciples, that, that the, the Gentile believers should be allowed in the church without her hindrance. And so James now speaks. Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Now, James' wording there is really important. This to take out of them a people for his name. That's the same kind of language used in the Old Testament when it talks about Abraham being called out of the other nations, of God choosing the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, to be his people, to be called by his name. So in stating it that way, James is actually saying that God has called out the Gentiles to be a people to him, just like God has called the Jews out to be a people unto him. And it's, as it says in Deuteronomy 14.2, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So he's using that same kind of language that was used for the Jews, for the Gentiles. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it's written. Now, Peter, Paul, and Barnabas, they've all, so, they've all really shared not so much the message that they preached, but what the Holy Spirit did through them on this. They're really not citing scripture when they're giving their description of what has happened. So Peter talked about how the Holy Spirit gave him and Cornelius dreams and visions and brought them together and then poured out his Holy Spirit. Paul and Barnabas even though they're citing, you know, we went here and we preached, and we went here and we went preached, what they're also, what they're also telling is this, these are the signs and wonders that God did throughout our journey to validate our message on this right here. God poured out his Holy Spirit on the Gentiles. And now we get to James citing Scripture to support the argument. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may see the Lord, seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Now, for the most part, 
That scripture is a quote from Amos, chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. Now, what's interesting here is even though they're in Jerusalem, it's a quote not from the Hebrew Bible, but from the Greek translation, the Septuagint, which words it a little bit differently in this right here. And additionally, some of the lines that are quoted there are not exactly quoted specifically word by word. And what James does here, which, you know, because puzzles me, every once in a while when I'm studying or just when I'm having my devotional time, I read when scriptures are quoted and I go, I flip back and I go, well, it sort of says in the Old Testament what they quoted, but why isn't it a little bit more direct and clear on that? And one of the things that I learned is that there was actually a practice in the Jewish world when you would quote a prophet to support something, a, a stance you were taking, that you might also include some allusions and statements from other prophets as well to support your main point. And that's a little bit of what James does here. He's got allusions from Jeremiah and Isaiah in this scripture as well. So even when he says that uh, with this, the words of the prophets agree. So even though he's quoting primarily one prophet, he's alluding to others as well. And in this case, a few terms do need to be defined. The tabernacle of David. That is not referring to the tabernacle that housed the, the uh, God's uh, Ark of the Covenant or anything like that. It is referring to David's house, that God had made the promise to him that, his, that, that one of his descendants would sit on his throne forever, ruling over not just the, the Jewish people, but over the entire world. That was a promise that God had made. But obviously, the temple had been destroyed. The people had been carried into exile in Assyria and Babylon. And even when they're back now in Jerusalem with the temple, they're still under Roman occupation. There is not yet a king from David's line on the throne and now, 2,000 years later, there still is no king of David's line on the throne in Jerusalem. But that's what it means, the tabernacle of David, that God would rebuild its ruins. But look especially that in verse 17 there, where it says, Even all the Gentiles who were called by my name. This means that the Gentiles are going to be a part of that rebuilt tabernacle of David. And that is that the Gentiles are going to be part and parcel of God's kingdom right along with the Jewish people because God himself has done this. Now, for some Jews, even though it was clear in the Old Testament, God was going to call the Gentiles, even him, that he was going to be a light to the Gentiles, um, that somehow it seemed like the, the Jewish people really never got that memo. They never really understood it or they never really embraced it. And so the scripture here is being quoted is reminding them this was, has been God's plan all along. And even though it's David's house, which is a Jewish house, he's going to rebuild David's house with both Jew and Gentile. He's going to reconcile them. The conflict, a much larger conflict than even what's going on right now in Antioch. The conflict between the peoples is going to be healed in Christ. <clears throat> now, Verse 18, known to God from eternity are all his works. Okay, I will admit, when I was reading this and I was trying to figure out how to preach this line here, I was going, what does this mean? Because it seems to be there floating on its own. Now, for some people who use other translations like the New American Standard, and I know that, uh, yes, Gail, that's probably next to godliness on it, uh, that they include verse 18 with the scriptures that were quoted by, uh, by James. And some of that's important because we need to remember that chapter and verse divisions, they're not part of the original languages. They, they, as the Bible was translated, as, we wanted, as they wanted to make it easier for people to find scriptures, chapters were added, then verse divisions were added. And sometimes when they uh, marked and standardized these things. It wasn't always in the best place, and I would kind of argue a little bit here that's what happened. It seems a little bit obscure in its translation, 
the New American Standard, though, simply says, says the Lord. So, in other words, those other, uh, that, all those scriptures that were quoted, and then says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. And the CEV, same kind of thing. God says, I promised it long ago. So all of these things, really the point that James is making is that God is the one who has said, I promised this from long ago, and now I'm fulfilling it. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. Okay, for those of us in the Gentile world, we can kind of look at this a little bit and scratch our head and go, why pick these things? Out of all of the Mosaic law, why pick these? Why choose these? And additionally, you know, even though James has said, okay, ultimately, we're just looking at it, it is faith alone, nothing else. But why then would, would James add anything if it's just by faith alone? Well, the, it turns out these recommended guideline, guidelines are going to allow the Jewish people, the Jewish believers who continue to follow the Jewish law, and there's no crime with them doing that. In fact, there's no indication that they're encouraged to stop obeying the law or not stop obeying the law of Moses. They can continue to be good Jews even though they are Christians. Um, but it will enable those law-observant Jewish people and the uncircumcised Gentiles to engage in fellowship, and especially to engage in fellowship around the table, to have their love feast as it is, communion, that kind of thing, um, to have that kind of fellowship, to be in one, e one another's homes, because there were certain things, especially that observant Jewish people could not do. It was a, basically a, a bridge too far at that point. And so, even though James is recognizing that God has called the Gentiles as Gentiles and not as Jewish converts, he's also recognizing that God is not telling the Jewish people to stop being Jews or to live like Gentiles. All four of these restrictions ultimately involved pagan worship practices and rituals um, that would have made Jewish fellowship with them absolutely impossible. Let's look at the first part there. To abstain from things polluted by idols. Well, one of the problems in the early church, especially in these Gentile cities and towns, is that the availability of meat was in the marketplace was primarily from animals that had been sacrificed in the temples. So a small portion of that would typically go to be burned up on the altar or to go for a feast for whoever did the animal sacrifice. And then a lot of the rest of the meat would just be sold in the marketplace. And so you always had to be careful with that. You know, the kosher meat was essentially not available in these towns. So it was always a challenge. So if you were invited to somebody's home for a meal, a Gentile's home, and you were a Jewish person, what did you do? Well, one of the lines of division here is basically that the restriction is not just on the meat that's sold in the marketplace, but on meat that is involved in feasts in the idol temples. Um, meat that was sold in the marketplace for the most part, uh, you know, Paul wrote about this in, I believe it was 1 Corinthians, uh, its consumption usually was allowable depending on the conscience of the person. But at the very least, if you were joining in, going to any kind of feast that was occurring at a table, at a temple, you were participating at some point with the worship of that God. Even though you were a Christian, even though you were saying, well, the idol's nothing, it is something. And it is what it is, is it, it is a distraction that is in competition with Yahweh. And so those things, they, they could not uh, participate in those things. Those literally were things polluted by idols. Now, from sexual immorality, that also be translated fornication, we need to recognize that the morals of the Gentiles were terrible. I mean, they were degenerate. Temple prostitution was common for most of the pagan gods and goddesses. And, you know, there were all sorts of fertility rites that were included in their worship. So sexual immorality was rampant. In fact, one commentator noted, it's been said that chastity was the only completely new virtue that Christianity brought into the world. 
Uh, in, the un, in the impure world, the Christian had to be pure. Now, it also seems to imply because, you know, that, that seems kind of a pretty clear thing there that you can't be participating in sexual immorality if you're a Christian. It also seems that maybe they're making a little bit more of a distinction going back to the Levitical laws, even with marriage, you know, because there's all sorts of rules that you can't marry someone close to you in a bloodline or a family kind of ma uh, manner. And it might even be alluding to King Herod who had married Herodias, his brother's wife. Remember, that's why John got his head cut off, because he challenged him on that. Turns out, well, it was, yes, it, it was, the woman had divorced Philip, his, uh, his brother, married him, and on top of that, according to bloodline things there, she was actually his, uh, his niece as well. So there were all sorts, yeah, <laughs> I see a couple of people shaking their heads there. Um, these were the morals of the Gentile nations. And so even if they weren't, say, committing immorality by going to the temple and engaging with the temple prostitute, even those marriages, those things that they were used to in their culture are being called into account and just saying these things defile you, these things make it hard for the Jewish people to have fellowship with you. So that was the second one. And from things strangled and from blood. You know, to the Jew... The life was in the blood. That's what God had said. And not only that, but it was the blood that was poured out for the animal sacrifices for sin. So the blood had great meaning, and it was actually common, again, in the Gentile world to strangle an animal, which we'll get to in the next part here, uh, but just to not to let the blood out and to consume it or even to make dishes with the animal blood. And that was all part of their worship. And so to the Jewish people, of course, that was absolutely hideous. You could not go to a Gentile place for dinner and go, oh, here, have some blood pie. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, they're going to run out of there, and you'll never see them again. <clears throat> and from things strangled and from blood. So we've already talked about the consuming of the blood, but uh, with things strangled, it was many times part of the animal sacrifice ritual that they would strangle the animal rather than cut its throat. And so, again, stay away from anything having to do with idol worship. <coughs> now, I want you to note la one last thing as we go on to the next verse, and that is that even though James tells them, don't engage in these activities, he is not telling them that they are sin necessarily that simply has to be refrained from on that. Because a little bit later he's going to say, you would do well to avoid these things. He doesn't say you're sinning and your, your salvation is in question on that if you're doing it. He just says you would do well to, to avoid these things because a lot of the, those practices are involving the meat or involving the sexual kind of stuff there. Um, were not make or break things on some parts of it. They were not sin, but they definitely interfered with any fellowship between Jew and Gentile. And here is his final clinching thing. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. James' final argument is that Moses writings have been read and preached weekly and yet they haven't made a difference in the lives of the Gentiles who attended synagogue and heard them. So if people could be saved through obeying the, uh, the Mosaic law, then that would have happened and it didn't. So now we get to the council's letter. And some of this is almost like rehashings, so we don't have to go over those points again. Uh, but there are some things I still want to highlight here. Um, then, in, then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barnab Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. So once the Jerusalem leaders and the whole church have made their decision at the council, 
that faith in Jesus alone is enough. Um, they're going to send Paul and Barnabas back to Antioch with the good news, and they're also going to send their own leaders to go with them. And, you know, first of all, it simply fits the scriptural mandate that a matter needs to be established by two or three witnesses. Now, you could simply say that Paul and Barnabas are those witnesses. Why send and others along? But as honorable as Paul and Barnabas are, as well as the other leaders from Antioch who probably went with them, you know, Pharisaical Jews, I'm sorry, Pharisaical Christians are everywhere. And they're not easily thwarted. We need to recognize that. So in this case, the church enlists Barsabbas, Judas, and Silas as their official representatives to go with Paul and Barnabas and to present the official verdict. These are basically voices from Jerusalem to support what Paul and Barnabas will report. That, so there's no question, are they fudging it? Are they, you know, maybe softening parts over here? Are they actually lying? You know, they could be accused of that. Now you have representatives, esteemed re representatives from Jerusalem going with them. Now, who were these people? Judas, who is also named Barsabbas. He's not mentioned otherwise in the New Testament except right here, although it does note, you know, he's one of the leading men of the brethren. Um, Barsabbas literally means son of the father. And that doesn't really tell us anything at all. You know, does it mean that he, like, you know, we, we saw with Barnabas, that meant son of encouragement. So, you know, was it just something about the quality of his life that he literally reflected God the father or something that it was so, his sonship was so evident that, that he was called Barsabbas? Uh, or does it mean he looked like his dad maybe, you know? Son of the father. Yeah, he looks just like his dad. I mean, maybe it's the equivalent of junior, you know? So we're, we're sending uh, junior and uh, Silas to, uh, to Antioch. Who knows on that right there? We don't really know what that was, but that's who Judas is. We don't know much. But Silas, we're going to get to know better. Uh, he has a bigger role in the book of Acts. He's going to become Paul's uh, partner as they go out to do their next missionary journey. He's going to be imprisoned with Paul and beaten right alongside Paul in Philippi. And he's going to partner with Timothy when Paul can't be with Timothy. Like Paul, Silas is a Roman citizen, and Paul also mentions him several times in his letters, 2 Corinthians 1 and 2 Thessalonians as well. So Silas is definitely more than just a bit part player here. And they wrote this letter by them, or they, uh, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. Now, just real quick on the map. Over here is Antioch. Down here is Jerusalem. So they're going to go back up to Antioch. This is Syria, the region of Syria. And then over here is the region of Cilicia as well. So this is the area that we're talking about with that. Now, since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. Now, the tone of this letter throughout, as we're going to see, and we're not going to take long with it, uh, is that it's friendly, it's even conciliatory, where there was conflict before. Um, it demonstrates a true concern for the Gentile church by the Jerusalem church uh, as they've endured having their very salvation challenged. Now, that Greek word troubled, it's actually a military metaphor for plundering a town. So when it says about troubling your souls, uh, troubling you with words, unsettling your souls, it's almost like they were plundering your souls with what they said. That was how devastating what they said was to you, and we recognize that. And so because you had that trouble caused by unendorsed men from Jerusalem, they're roundly condemned, and their message was bluntly disavowed as well. To whom we gave no such commandment. They're clear. They are absolutely clear. We didn't send them out. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. 
men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you may recognize that phrase, with one accord. I've made a point of that before. It should ring a bell, you know, in your memory. Uh, just as a reminder, it means of one purpose or of one mind. And it was really a unique Greek word that's used almost exclusively in the book of Acts. And it shows up about uh, 10 times in the book of Acts. And at least seven to eight of those times have to do with the church. And it's actually the Greek word. It's a compound of two words meaning to rush along or in unison. And the image is almost musical. A number of notes are sounded which, while different, harmonize in pitch and tone as the instruments of a great concert under the direction of a concert master. So the Holy Spirit blends together the lives of the members of Christ's church. So in this case here, they're be having the, the Jerusalem Council ultimately ended up being assembled in one accord like a great orchestra of beautiful music to God. Um, and they're the ones who are sending Paul and Barnabas back, respecting what they've done and encouraging them and the church in Antioch. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. So not only are they sending the Antioch leaders back, they're sending highly respected men. And we need to remember that the previous group that troubled them were not sent out. So they're being very, very clear, these people are being sent out by us. You can trust their message. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from the things offered to idols, etc., etc. Um, verse 28 here clearly states what's been implied all along and that we've seen all along in the book of Acts. God's Holy Spirit guides and oversees and builds his church. So when they can say it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, it's very clear, especially mentioning the Holy Spirit first, the Holy Spirit has been guiding us and directing us even in this council, even with the disagreement, even as we worked toward consensus, it was the Holy Spirit's leading. And the council in Jerusalem accomplished two great feats. First of all, it set a standard for how Jewish and Gentile believers should be able to worship and live in community. That's what those various laws uh, or uh, recommendations were. And it also set a standard for how the multicultural church can respectfully work together. In other words, you look at how they handled it. They listened to each other. They disagreed with each other. They cited scripture. They cited experience. And in the very end, they not only came to a conclusion that was biblically based, but they also sought to determine the least burdensome requirements on the Gentile church as well. And, you know, if Christian leaders and laity, if all of us, whenever we're involved in any kind of conflict, if we can use their example, the church could be a peaceful and unified place. This has all been about conflict, and I haven't you know, said, okay, well, here's another point, here's another point of, uh, uh, of application, because the application kind of screams at us through all of this, of how to be respectful to each other, of how to listen to one another, of how to bring in scripture and these other points, and see, and then ultimately, as I said here, what's the least, um, the least burdensome agreement that we can come to on this? Now, the message and the ministry. And so they were sent off. As they were, and so they were sent off. They came to Antioch, and when they had gathered together the multitude, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. So previously, you'd had this divisive message. Now they're bringing a joyful message. It affirms that their understanding and practice of God's salvation through faith alone is complete. And it actually was healing to their souls. Remember, it was like their souls had been plundered. And so it is 
it is healing to them. And that's what happens here. Judas and Silas, themselves being prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. Well, when we look at what was the role of a New Testament prophet, it was not just to predict future things. It was to speak the word of God. It was to exhort people and to encourage their hearts. And that's what Judas and Silas do. They encourage the people with many words. And after they'd stayed there for a long time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. So their mission complete, Judas goes back, the others go back, although we're going to see that Silas remains there. Um, and now, instead of division, instead of the possibility even of a church split, the church is stronger than it was at the start of the conflict. And we want to recognize that too. Conflict's not a bad thing sometimes. Conflict can be messy, it can be challenging, it can be hurtful, but if we can come through it respectful for one an with one another, the church and our relationships within there can be stronger. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord, with many others also. Um, verse 34 there, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Um, some of the scripture, uh, some of the translations don't have that. It looks almost like that's a late addition, just to clarify a point in some of the texts, so it's unclear. But, you know, it doesn't change any doctrine, doesn't change anything in the meaning of the scripture here. And really, all it does is state the obvious. Silas remained, the others went back. And as Paul and Barnabas remain there and they resume their old duties of teaching and preaching, others are also joining them in the work. And the picture we get here at the end, after all this conflict, is that you have a healthy and thriving church. So to just wrap this up with, with application, when we have conflict, be humble. Actually be willing to listen. As I mentioned at the beginning, are we wanting to be right or are we wanting to apprehend the truth? Do we really want to know the truth? Are we so sure that what we have is the full truth that we're not willing to listen beyond there or even have it challenged. Because what happened is for some of those who thought they were right, they allowed themselves to be proven wrong. They came with open hearts and open minds no matter how vehemently they defended their position at the start. It's okay to start there. Just be humble within there. Listen, always come ready to be proven wrong because if you're looking at the scriptures, if you're listening to the Holy Spirit, as Jesus said, he will guide you into all truth. And as it says in Psalm 133, this is really, really important to God. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded his blessing, life evermore. And just that little point, the dew of Hermon. Mount Hermon was the highest mountain in Israel. It was known for its heavy dew. Its dew was considered a blessing from God because it helped the land be fruitful. Unity is like that. It nourishes, it brings God's blessing, and it helps the land be fruitful. It helps the church be fruitful. And so we want to strive for that unity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the direction that you give us, or the directions you give us, um, that we can see how the church, the early church, worked through a very difficult conflict, establishing a principle for all time that, yes, indeed, faith in Jesus is enough, that our only work we can do is to believe in Jesus, the one whom you have sent, that we add nothing else than our belief in Jesus Christ. And so we give you that praise, Lord. We, we pray that, uh, you know, should conflicts arise in this church or between other churches here in 
Panama City, may we be agents of peace, agents of reconciliation. Should disagreements arise within this church among people, same thing, Lord, may we be humble, may we listen, may we be willing to lay down our, our rights, kind of like Paul said, uh, just like the James had said to the Gentiles, well, forego this and this and this. You do well to abstain from those things, Lord. Help us to not claim our rights, that we desire to be right in you and according to Scripture and according to your Holy Spirit. And so by that, Lord, guide us into all truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.